Um, let me tell you that I'm very, very pleased to be here. As you know, IUCN and Europarks have a lot in common. Um, Europarks is a member of IUCN. I've been with IUCN for the last 21 years, and for the last year, I've taken on the responsibilities to manage our program in the pan-European region, Europe, Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. Today, uh, I'll be, or this morning, I should say, I'll be uh, trying to manage a program with five fantastic speakers. I have five fantastic speakers, but before I move to them, I just wanted to give you a few thoughts uh, for myself, really. We all know, and you all know, that biodiversity is life. Without biodiversity, there would be no life. About half the world's poor people depend on biodiversity directly. They live off the land. They depend on the goods and services that are provided. Biodiversity provides us with what we call many ecosystem services. Not just food, not just building materials, but also services like regulating climate, regulating water flows, supporting soil production and therefore agricultural production, and values that are much more difficult to capture, spiritual values, aesthetic values, values for recreation, just the value for nature itself. We do know through a study that is being carried out at the moment, and we'll finalize at the big conference in Nagoya next month, that it is worth investing in biodiversity. This study, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, has estimated that the loss of biodiversity is somewhere in the order of one to three trillion thousand billion US dollars per year. An amazing amount of money. At the same time, there are figures that if we were to manage and if we had the investment, protected areas could generate somewhere in the order of four to five trillion US dollars per year. For a banker, and the deep study is managed by a banker, this is good business. And Pavan Sukdev often says, it is worth investing in nature. But although it may be worth it, the political will still, still seems to be lacking. The same study says at the moment we are spending about 8 to 10 billion per year on managing biodiversity. That's not just protected area management. The overall work of protecting nature, conservation, and managing biodiversity. We know that that is presumably 10% or less of what we need. Just managing our protected areas network around the world would cost us about 22 billion or so. And to make sure that we have a 10% coverage of protected areas, which is our goal, would add another 28 billion at least. So we're talking 50 billion around that figure for just protected area management. And of course, there is more money needed. So, we know that it is worth it, and yet, we're not yet investing. We're not yet doing it. Why is that? I guess one of the issues is biodiversity is a complicated concept. The word itself is not easy to grasp. There was a study carried out by the European Environment Agency last year, in Europe, of course, and from a whole group of people, these were just, you know, the man and the woman in the street, only one-third said they understood what biodiversity meant. Two-thirds have no idea. The anecdote is that one senior politician in the UK thought it was a type of washing powder. One of the issues is, of course, many people equate biodiversity with, with wilderness abroad, with Africa, with wild animals, with the poles, far away, not in Europe. And that's partially maybe because in Europe, our landscape is managed. We've only left with about 2% of wilderness. And I'm sure Harvey, who is speaking later this morning, will tell you a little bit more about that. We've managed our land for recreation, for health, and many other reasons. But Europe is very rich in biodiversity. So there's no reason why we shouldn't take care of this. Many of these pictures, just as an aside, are from the Wild Wonders of Europe initiative, a group of photographers in Europe that are trying to really capture the beauty of Europe. 
The bad news is we're still losing it. We didn't reach the 2010 target, and things don't look good. This is a graph that was produced for the uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook earlier this year, and it shows you very quickly the pressure, sorry, the state of biodiversity, the state of species, the health of nature is going down. The pressures on biodiversity due to fragmentation, pollution, changes is going up. But the most worrying part is the graph at the bottom. Because if you look at it, this is our response. What have we done to overcome these problems? At the WCCD in Johannesburg in 2002, all countries pledged to halt the loss of biodiversity by the year 2010. And if you look at that bottom graph, at 2002, it starts leavening off. So whilst we made a political statement and we all said we're going to do something, the actual response was not an increase, but a leveling off. To go back to the state of biodiversity, our red list of species shows us that around the world we're losing about a quarter to a third of just about every species in every group. The situation for Europe is not any better. But it's not all bad news. There is some good news as well, fortunately. Whilst we're losing species, we've been able to show that without conservation efforts, we would have lost even more. Now, that may sound like a bit of a difficult argument, but certainly it's not as bad as it could have been. Moreover, in your area of work, the number of protected areas and the areas covered under protection has increased tremendously over the last 100 years. So that is good news. And whilst not all national parks and protected areas are managed as effective as we would like them to do, we have shown that they will help us stop the loss of biodiversity and habitat destruction. And we have raised awareness. The Countdown 2010 initiative over the last years has created a real movement of more than a thousand partners, private sector, local authorities, institutions, people that are not normally interested and involved in nature conservation. We've worked with the European Union presidencies, we've had some materials, a website, and a whole number of success stories that we are putting on the web at the moment, if you're interested. The challenge is how to scale all this up to success. And the next moment that we were really going to be talking about this is the meeting in Nagoya next month, the end of October, which is the 10th Conference of Parties of the CBD. And I'm sure Sarat, who will talk after me, will tell us a bit more about this. The three key issues in Nagoya are going to be what's going to happen after 2010, the next strategic plan, the whole question of access and benefit sharing, and last but certainly not least, the question about resourcing, the questions about who is going to pay for this. Three very political, very charged issues. One of the other things, of course, that is going to be discussed is the program of work on protected areas. And just one slide, we had a meeting last year, an international conference to prepare for this, IUCN and the World Commission on Protected Areas, which was held in Jeju in Korea, and a whole list of recommendations for the Nagoya meeting, including we need more money in protected areas, we need to link climate change in protected areas, and I think John Jarvis will be talking about that later this morning, linking the protected areas uh, the program of work on protected areas with the program of work on forests and access benefit sharing, a framework and cost benefit analysis, better reporting, master plans for national protected area systems, targets and indicators, and again, the all encompassing question about funding. So, the next step is Nagoya. It's not the end, of course, there will be other meetings. 2012, very important, 20 years after the Rio Convention and looking back on what has happened. Later that year, the IUCN World Conservation Congress. Then 2014, the World Parks Congress. We're not sure yet where. 2015, we are reporting back on the Millennium Development Goals. And then, of course, the CBD next month will talk about their 10-year vision to 2020 and the long-term thinking 2050. When I told my wife I was coming here, she said, that's wonderful. Another meeting, more talking. And I said, no. This is different, because the people I'm talking to today are the ones that are actually doing the work. So I want to basically tell you, it's now over to you. Let's stop talking and let's make it happen. Thank you.